What is up, WAP? What is going on? So this a beautiful Friday morning. I am about to break down Unit 3, Part 1, which is um, our first of the units with this time period, 1450 to 1750. Because this is a huge time period in this class. It's a huge time period in world history because there are so many really important things that go on. Um, we have our first global um, time period where the entire world is connected. And there's a lot that um, causes the entire world to be connected. And then there's a lot of things that are um, going to happen as a result of the entire world being connected. And when we talk about world history in our previous unit from 1200 to 1450, um, the, the great power and wealth really comes from Asia. Talk about all the best innovations and technologies. Those are coming from Asia. When you talk about everyone wanting to get to Asia um, because of how much wealth and the goods that it has. Um, when we get into this time period, things shift. If we were doing a power rankings of the different areas of the world, the different states of the world, Europe in the previous unit would have been very, very low. They would have had a power ranking of the Western Europe would have had power rankings of about four or five. Um, when we get into this, this time period, um, Spain and France and England and Russia, their power rankings go way up. They go into eight, nine you know, areas. And then China, in the previous unit, their power ranking was probably an eight or a nine, and now it goes down to maybe a six. Um, and the reason being is because of what happens in this time period. It's a very, very influential time period. Um, we'll start with theme number one. Um, in Europe, we see nation states emerging. Nation states are states in which the entire state, the, the government and the land controlled by that government, are people that have share the same language and culture. Um, we saw that Western Europe didn't have these nation states. Instead, they were really a people that um, were in feudalism, that were united only by religion, by Roman Catholicism. In this time period, that changes. People identify as Spanish or French or English or Russian, um, and they're united under a king, and that king is usually an absolute monarch, and they have power given to them by God. And because of this, this is a drastic change from the power of the Catholic Church. And what allows these really powerful absolute monarchs to emerge in this time period is the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation is going to come in and hurt the influence of the Catholic Church. We'll see religious wars like the Thirty Years' War that's fought in Europe between Protestants and Catholics throughout Europe. Um, and this allows our kings, for instance, the kings of England, to form their own churches in which they are the head of it. That's the Anglican Church. And they use their own tax collectors and their own laws. And so Europe be, starts to become the modern day nation states that we see today in the world. Um, also, because Europe has this now centralized power and because they have um, streamlined tax collection, they now have so much wealth that they start to sponsor um, explorations. And they will start with the Portuguese. We'll see our age of exploration. They discover, of course, the new world. They also make it into the Indian Ocean. And so and in the new world, we see the Colombian exchange and the triangular trade interaction between Europe and Africa and America. We see syncretic cultures and religions that way. Um, we also see our first era of colonization. And we learn about two eras of colonization um, in WAP. The first is during this time period, 1450 to 1750. The next one will be at the end of our next time period when we talk about the scramble for Africa and we talk about um, the second wave of colonization. But our first wave of colonization is going to be um, driven by mercantilism, driven by the amounts, um, the desire to add gold and silver into the vaults of these countries. Um, we'll see colonization, of course, in the Americas, but also South Asia, which is India, especially the British East India Company, and then Southeast Asia, especially with the Portuguese and the Dutch. Um, and then where we're going to start today is Asia in this time period. Asia has, up until this point, had the most wealth and prosperity. But we see that um, especially China, who's been the power state in, in Asia, China is going to go into a self-imposed isolation after Zhangke's voyages and limiting its own maritime trade is going to um, proportionately weaken it compared to the states in Europe. 
it's going to go through a slow economic decline that's going to allow it in our upcoming time period to be the subject of imperialism by European powers. But of course, China isn't the only state in Asia. Japan becomes more powerful. It unifies under three rulers. Um, and then the gunpowder empires. And we start today with the gunpowder empires because they are going to come in and they are going to fill the void left by the Mongols. Um, when we look at this map here, we see a map of Asian land empires. And the word land is important in this, guys, because when we look at Europe, which of course, you know, is over here, um, our, those are our nation states. They're not empires as much as they're, they're nation states. They're going to come in and they're going to form maritime empires. What that means is they're going to form colonies um, by sea coming across, not connected to their own state, but instead across the oceans in one way or another, either throughout the Indian Ocean or across the Atlantic Ocean. But in Asia, um, these states are forming land-based empires. They are connected to their own state and they're going to expand you know, by land. And while this is going to make these empires you know, formidable and powerful, they're not going to derive the same kind of wealth that our maritime empires are deriving from mercantilism. Okay, so we start with the Gunpowder Empire, and our Gunpowder Empire is going, there's three of them, of course, the Ottoman Empire, the Safavid, and the Mughal Empire, and they are going to emerge um, in what we call the power vacuum left by the Mongols. And what that means is the Mongols came in, they destroyed everything, they collected tribute, and then they were eventually pushed out. They were pushed out in, from whoever... Um, you know, region that they had taken over. But by doing so, the, the state that pushes them out has to expend a tremendous amount of resources and wealth and manpower to be able to push the Mongols out. And this leaves the region very weak and vulnerable to oncoming invaders. And so we see a new group, nomadic groups from Turkic backgrounds coming in from Central Asia. And they are going to come in and form the three gunpowder empires, taking advantage um, of the power vacuums left by the Mongols. And they've got a lot of things in common. These are called the gunpowder empires because they're going to come in with heavy artillery, especially cannons, um, and come in and put the, the cities to siege the, in these respective places. Um, they're also going to justify their conquest with Islam. But you'll notice down at the bottom, they all practiced Islam differently. Um, we need to be able to compare these gunpowder empires. That's what the College Board wants us to do. We, we need to know the similarities. They're all of Turkic background. They all practice Islam. They all use gunpowder weapons. But we also need to know their differences. And one of the differences is actually how they practice Islam. In the Ottoman Empire, they're a Sunni empire. Um, the Safavid Empire, they're a Shia empire. And then the Mughal Empire, it's Sunni, but we see that different leaders are going to kind of twist and alter their religion. For instance, Akbar, who's going to create his own religion, Din Ilahi. Um, and then we have Aurangzeb, who is going to insist on a very strict form of Sunni Islam. So there is a little bit of nuance to the religions in these places. So um, we do need, do need to know the differences. And of course, in every gunpowder, excuse me, every Islamic empire, there's always going to be um, a... Um, a preference to learning, to literature, um, and that is especially true of these gunpowder empires. While it's not so much about books and literature and libraries as it was with our first caliphates like the Umayyad or the Abbasid or the uh, uh, Al-Andalus in Spain, um, this is going to be more about art and architecture, and we need to be able to, com to compare the architecture of these different gunpowder empires. But before the gunpowder empires, we have a, um, a conqueror by the name of Tamerlane. He gets that name from Timur the Lame. He had a limp. He was shot in the leg. Um, and he's going to set the stage for the gunpowder empires because he is going to show the blueprint for how these gunpowder empires can come in and conquer um, new lands. Um, he is a descendant of the Mongols. He believes that he is going to form a new Mongol Khanate. He's going to start from Samarkand in Central Asia, which is in modern day Uzbekistan. And he's going to move into Persia and India. And as I said, he sets the blueprint. Um, and the way that he does this is by justifying his conquering and by acquiring conquerors by um, something called the Ghazi ideal. And he is going to say, follow me um, because 
you are going to be fulfilling your role as a holy fighter for Islam. Um, we will we will migrate into lands that are not at this time controlled by a strong Muslim ruler, um, and you will help me extend Islam. I am the sword of Islam, and this Ghazi ideal of extending Islam by being a holy fighter is going to be embraced by all of our conquerors of the gunpowder empires and used to conquer new lands. Um, another way in which he sets the stage is using gunpowder weapons, um, especially cannons. That's what this heavy artillery is all about. He's also going to be ruthless in his conquerings, coming into um, India, for instance, massacring 100,000 Hindus. Um, and yet, very contradictorily, he's also going to set the stage by encouraging learning and art. The best example for Tamerlane in his distinctive art is the capital of Samarkand. Um, this is our basis of what we call Timurid art and architecture. Tamerlan makes this his capital. Um, it is a center of learning and literature. Um, we see these, these classic domes, um, which are a, a um, Timurid uh, staple in his architecture. We also see these towers, and that's going to show the, the Hindu influence or the Indian influence. And so we see a lot of these... Um, syncretic art wherever you go that's going to have this Islamic influence as well as the influence of whatever area is being conquered. Um, Tamerlane, his empire crumbles very, very quickly. Um, and while he set the stage of showing that you could use heavy artillery, um, he also set the stage of showing the, the gunpowder empires to come of what not to do. And what he didn't do was he didn't create a political structure in the places that he conquered. He, he conquers this huge amount of territory, but then he doesn't set up leaders that help him administer his rule. He doesn't set up bureaucracies or bureaucrats or tax collection agencies. Instead, he just stations his army in defeated areas. And eventually it becomes way too expensive to keep that army um, regulating that area and his empire is going to collapse. And while expensive armies are a similarity in all of our gunpowder empires, our gunpowder empires are going to learn from Tamerlan's mistake and try to set up some sort of bureaucracy in their respective empires. Um, the first one that we talked about is the Ottoman Empire. This is by far our largest and longest standing of the Islamic empires. And in history, it's unique to the sense that a single dynasty controls it for the entire 600 years, the same ruling family. Um, that is incredible. That is a, a lot of stability that is really unmatched in world history. Um, how does it start? So it is going to capitalize on the most important straits um, throughout history to this point, which is the Bosporus Strait. I'm going to go back to that previous slide to show that it is the, the Black Sea coming into the Mediterranean Sea. And it's this strait right here, formerly Constantinople, formerly the Byzantine Empire, that is going to be conquered first by the Turks. The Ottoman Empire will make the capital at Constantinople. They will rename it in Istanbul. And because of its location, the Ottoman Empire is going to become incredibly wealthy by controlling through force trade in the Mediterranean. That's what makes the Ottoman Empire the most long lasting of the empires because of its location, because it controls this ever important Bosporus Strait, and it, because it can regulate trade in the Mediterranean Sea. And one of the first leaders that we have to know of the Ottoman Empire is this guy, Mehmed II. He's going to come in with 26 foot bronze cannons and he is going to besiege Constantinople and finally it falls in 1453. You might remember Constantinople had been weakened for two major things in the preceding time period, one of which was the Fourth Crusade, the second of which was the plague. Um, the Ottomans come in and this, and by the way, that's a perfect example of um, the, the power vacuum that was left by the Mongols. Obviously, the Mongols spread the plague, and this is going to weaken the areas in which the gunpowder empires come in and conquer. Anyways, here comes Mehmed II. He conquers Constantinople. He renames it Istanbul. It's going to prosper because of its location on that Bosporus Strait. And he, like the other Muslim rulers of the gunpowder empires, is going to build tremendous architecture in his lands, his best example of which is this picture down at the right called the Topkapi Palace which is the new royal residence of the sultans of the Ottoman Empire. Topkapi Palace means Canaan's Gate. And if you can remember, Mehmed II overtook Constantinople. You may remember then that his Topkapi Palace is his 
architectural achievement. Um, Mehmed II is going to expand and expand and expand early on when Western Europe is still very weak and is also going through its own religious wars in the time period. He's going to be able to expand all the way into Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, and this area, guys, is an area that becomes a very, very um, volatile area. You might remember that the Ottomans are going to come and they're going to conquer this land. This land is predominantly Christian. Um, and when these lands start to become independent of the Ottoman Empire, they are going to fight over which lands should be part of what state. That is going to be a leading cause of nationalism in the Balkan Peninsula and, and eventually lead to World War I. Um, also in this area, you'll remember that the Ottoman Empire is the one that uses the Dev Shirma, which is going to um, come in and abduct Christian boys from this very Christian region over here and convert them to Islam and then put them into their bureaucracy um, in the capital of Istanbul. So um, the Ottoman Empire um, expands and expands early on. They especially are going to become wealthy again by controlling the Mediterranean. To do so, they have to come in and, and fight the city-state of Venice. They attack Venice. They force them to pay a tax. And we see that this is a heavily, heavily controlled and regulated empire um, through the Mediterranean Sea. And then this guy, Suleiman, is going to rule the Ottoman Empire at its height. He is going to rule the Ottoman Empire at its biggest size. Um, he is going to move into Central Europe, putting Vienna under siege twice, moving into Hungary and Austria. Um, he fails to make all the way into Western Europe. One of the reasons he fails is because he can't move his cannons that far in. The, there's huge rains. It's a rainy season. Um, he can't push his cannons through the forest. And so um, he has to try to take Western Europe without his cannons. Um, and he fails to do so. And so Solomon is our last strong empire of the Ottoman, excuse me, the last strong sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And so guys, when you when you think about these empires, you need to remember their strong sultans, you need to remember their achievements, and you need to, rem need to remember um, what art they contributed. Mehmed II was our first, he contributed to Copy Palace. Suleiman is going to bring the Suleimani Mosque. The Suleimani Mosque is in Istanbul. It's this beautiful mosque over here representing the architecture um, of the, the time period and of this Islamic um, architecture. Very beautiful. Um, okay, so now we talk about the Safavids. The Safavids um, are our shortest lasting empire, but their contributions, especially their religious contributions, are still being felt today. Um, but it's got some severe location problems. Um, it has this great location where it has access to the Indian Ocean, and yet it doesn't have a strong navy. In fact, none of our um, gunpowder empires were very strong in the oceans. Um, the Ottoman Empire was strong in the Mediterranean, but none of them had these maritime empires that we see Western Europe has in the time period. Um, they also have flat lands. They're very open to attack, and that's a problem because they have powerful neighbors to the north like Russia, but they also have to deal with the other gunpowder empires. The Safavid empires are only Shia empire, and they are between two Sunni Muslim empires, and that creates some serious problems for the Safavids in territorial disputes and other religious and political disputes. Um, our first ruler that we learn about is uh, our boy Ismail over here, who I say boy because he starts at only 15 years old. Um, he is going to capitalize on the fact that there is a sizable Shia population within the Ottoman Empire and within Central Asia that um, does not yet have a state that they can call their own. And he is going to use this um, to rally Shia um, from all over Asia. And he is going to march upon this area that has been vacated by the Abbasid dynasty and declare himself the Shah. This is modern day Iran. Um, and he declares that Shia Islam is the state religion. Um, of course, by doing so, this is going to put him in conflict with the neighboring Sunni uh, kingdoms. Um, but he sets a long lasting impact here because modern day Iraq and Iran are by far our highest populations of Shia Islam um, in the Middle East. And so this is a, obviously a very modern 
um, development. The other leader that we have to know from the, Sh the Safavid Empire is Shah Abbas I. Um, just like Suleiman I of the Ottoman Empire, Shah Abbas I is going to rule the Safavid Empire at its height, at its biggest extent. He moves the capital to Isfahan, which becomes his contribution to art, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, under Shah Abbas, he is going to be both the religious leader and the political leader of the empire, which becomes a, um, a similarity upon all of our gunpowder empires where they are um, the, the leaders, the shahs or um, the sultans become the religious leader as well as the political leader. Um, he's also going to import weaponry and military advisors from Europe, especially Britain. Um, which allows him to fight off enemies, especially the impeding Portuguese that start to come in and try and control um, what is now a modern day Iran. Um, Shah Abbas I, his contribution, the beautification of Isfahan, adding parks and avenues and mosques and schools and gardens and pools. Um, again, we just have to go through and know one example of each just so that you can provide um, outside evidence if we were to get these questions on the gunpowder empires. Um, like many of our Middle Eastern women at this stage, um, we see this kind of conflicted rights. Um, our Safavid women especially, um, as has been the tradition in Persia, are veiled, they are restricted, but they are not yet, you know, they're not as restricted as our women of, say, China or India. Um, they do have the right to inherit in extreme cases. They have the right to divorce. So we do see that women have some rights um, in the gunpowder empires as compared to some really limited rights as we go further east. Um, India, that is where our, our third gunpowder empire emerges. That will be the Mughal Empire. And India already has had Islam um, come in in the previous time period, circa 1200 to 1450. We just learned about this stuff. So I'll give you a reminder, right? We have all of these Muslim invaders, the Umayyad, Mehmet of Ghazni, then the Delhi Sultanate. We do already see a minority religion forming um, where we see our um, Delhi Sultanate getting converts from the Jizya. We also have two Hindu kingdoms dominating down in the south. Um, Mughal India um, is now weakened because of the, Del the Delhi Sultan. It was weakened from the Mongols. And so we have Babur, who is Tamerlan's great grandson, come in and conquer uh, northern India and form the Mughal India dynasty, which is our last of our gunpowder empires. They push out the last Delhi Sultanate ruler. Um, but as we see in India, it is very difficult to rule the entire subcontinent as a Muslim ruler because no matter how many years a Muslim ruler controls India, there is going to be predominantly Hindu population. And so it is very difficult for the Mughal Empire to, to rule over its people. And yet one person finds a strategy that is successful, and that person is Akbar. And Akbar is um, perhaps our most important of our gunpowder empire rulers because he does so many amazing things in being able to rule over a heavily divided place in India. Um, he is uh, the grandson of Babur. He establishes his capital at Delhi. Um, and he knows that he needs to have a very well organized government to be able to rule over this highly diverse population. So he creates a very strong centralized government. And in order to show that he is fair to all his people, regardless of their religion, he gives each citizen the right to appeal to him for a final judgment in lawsuits, um, regardless of their religion. And because of this, and hearing about how fair he administers his empire, he draws the brightest men from all of Central Asia to come in and serve him. And he also is going to have the most modern bureaucracy. Um, he is going to pay government officials with specific duties. Um, he is going to um, collect taxes. He's going to have construction or control of the water supply. So he has an organized bureaucracy, a very modern bureaucracy. Um, later, he's going to turn to tax farming. Um, he's going to allow his bureaucrats to come in and control lands and then keep one third of the taxes um, that are paid to the government. This is called tax farming. 
And tax farming actually um, becomes a problem after Akbar's rule. These zamindars, these bureaucrats of the Mughal Empire, um, start to keep some of the taxes for themselves. And then they become the people that they rule over start to become more loyal to them, the local rulers, than they do to the actual sultans. That creates a problem because now you have these landed aristocrats that have more political power than the sultan themselves. And that's just an open invitation for um, dissent and disloyalty. Um, and that's what happens eventually in India and one of the contributions to the end of the Mughal dynasty. But under Akbar, the system worked very well. Akbar is also very famous for his tolerance of all religions. Um, we see he, first of all, is going to give grants of money or, or land to different churches. Um, he gives money to Hindus. He gives money to Muslims. We also see Sikhism that is going to emerge in this time period, which is kind of a blend between Hinduism and Sufism, which is now becoming the fifth largest religion in the world. Um, he also gives land to a Catholic church in Goa, which is um, a city state down in the southwestern portion of India. So as you can see, he is really, truly a very, very tolerant ruler. Um, and this allows India to have an unprecedented amount of success in this time period. Um, and on that note, um, he gives Hindus positions in his bureaucracy, his zamindars. He marries Hindu wives. He has a Christian wife. He exempts Hindus from paying the jizya. So all of these things. Um, and he even is going to um, try and create his own religion, Dini Lahi. And Dini Lahi is a, it means divine faith. And it's a combination of Islam, of Hinduism, um, of Christianity, even a little bit of Zoroastrianism, the ancient Persian religion. Um, however, while he creates this religion, um, his, his people largely stay with their current religions. They largely stay Hindu. And so this was perhaps um, the, the failure of Akbar, besides the unfortunate um, failure to prohibit child marriages and the sati in India. These are very, very ancient traditions that continue during his rule. Child marriages, nasty stuff, guys, where, where men were, were marrying girls. Um, sit even as low as six or seven years of age, nasty. And also the sati, which we know is when the, the wife, uh, the widowed wife um, would throw herself upon the funeral pyre of her husband. So we still have obviously a very, very patriarchal system going on in India. Um, and yet Akbar tries to end these things unsuccessfully. Um, the economy of the Mughal Empire under Akbar is very, very successful with this very uh, modern bureaucracy um, and well-regulated government. We see that textiles and spice trade is flourishing. They're getting gold and silver flowing into the empire because of all of the Arab merchants in the Indian Ocean. We see all of this wealth coming in and we already have a religious system in place to um, deal with all of this trade because our Vaisha caste has our merchants already there and already part of this well-orchestrated system. And so things flourish quite wonderfully under Akbar. Of course, we also need to talk about art when talking about the gunpowder empires and art is going to flourish for 200 years in Mughal India. Um, the best example is the Taj Mahal which was created by Shah Jahan as a tomb for one of his wives, which I always chuckle at because what did the other wives get? Um, what the Taj Mahal does is it gives us a couple of different things. It shows us one example of art in the Mughal dynasty. Um, and it also gives us syncretism. Um, syncretism um, in this case is between our Islamic art, calligraphy, ceramics, and our local Hindu arts with the geometric designs um, and the towers that we see here. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the declines of these empires, um, and we're going to talk about each of the reasons and why they decline. And they have unique reasons for their decline, and they also have um, similar reasons for their decline. Um, 
A unique reason for the decline of the Ottoman Empire is the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. This is the Spanish and the Venetians, two Catholic forces coming together to fight the Ottomans. They want to have free trade in the Mediterranean Sea. And for over a hundred years, the Ottomans have controlled the trade in the Mediterranean Sea and are consistently taking tribute or taxes from all trade through the Mediterranean Sea. Um, by the Spanish and the Venetians winning this battle, the Battle of Lepanto, the Ottomans stop having control over all trade in the Mediterranean. And this is gonna lead to a decline in their wealth. Um, which is obviously significant because uh, with this decline in wealth, um, we see that the, the empire starts to fall and decline, especially their military. Um, a commonality amongst all of the gunpowder empires are weak sultans. Um, we see weak sultans in this case in the Ottoman Empire after Solomon. Um, when we talk about the Safavid Empire, we'll see weak sultans after Shah Abbas I. Um, in the Mughal dynasty, we'll see weak sultans after Akbar. So in all of these situations, we see weak sultans. One of the biggest reasons is harem politics, which we've talked about many times. But if you don't remember, harem politics were the politics going on in the harem as we see multiple uh, sultans taking multiple wives and having all of these children with concubines, etc. And then we have these large um, secession disputes, who is going to come next, which creates some, you know, obviously some compromised sultans. And then strong neighbors, another commonality amongst the decline of the Ottoman empires for the Ottomans, uh, for, excuse me, the gunpowder empires for the Ottomans, it's Russia. Now notice the Ottoman Empire doesn't fall to 1918, guys. That is the end of World War I. You remember the Ottomans held on until World War I where they faithfully sided with Germany and Austria-Hungary. Okay, the Safavids are also going to decline um, and they're going to decline again because of weak shahs, the weak leaders after Shah Abbas I. They have these lavish lifestyles, high military spending. Um, also, there was a rebellion um, in the Safavid Empire by a Sunni leader. We remember our Safavids are Shia. Our Sunni leader, Mamun Hotaki, is going to rebel in the name of Sunni Islam. He's going to sack the capital Isfahan and declare himself the Shah of Persia. Now, he hasn't conquered all of the empire, but he has claimed the capital. And so we have this odd situation where the capital is being controlled by a rebel government for three years. And while the Safavid Empire continues um, without the capital governing, the collection of taxes was very difficult. And because of this, the Safavid Empire runs out of money and eventually is going to collapse because the Ottomans seize land from them and then the Russians seize land from them. Um, and then our decline of the Mughal Empire um, really starts by this guy, Aurangzeb. And Aurangzeb is the exact opposite of Akbar. He wants to expand India and he wants to do it his way with his specific brand of Islam, which is extremely pious and extremely strict. Um, he wants to have a very plain focus on the doctrines of Islam. He wants to ban all things that he believes are unnecessary, including music and dance, and rid the empire of everything else, including Hindu influences. And of course, you can't rid India of Hindu influences. It's not going to work. And so he has rebellions from everyone in his empire. Hindu princes are going to rebel. Muslim princes are going to rebel. And after this, um, the, the empire is weakened and start to fall to um, invaders from Europe, the French, and especially the British, as the British take political power officially from the Mughals in 1858. That's the start of the British Raj. But really, as early as 1600, um, the British are going to start moving in with the British East India Company. Our similarities in the decline of all of the empires, we have competition amongst the heirs with the harem politics, um, expensive armies, especially um, the heavy artillery that costs money, you need to have heavy taxes, and then the, the neighbors, the Europeans, um, and just the other gunpowder empires, and of course the religious differences down below. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about East Asia, and we'll specifically talk about China and Japan. Um, China has just come out of the Yan Dynasty. The Yan Dynasty fell away. Um, the Mongol Dynasty, of course, uh, with under Kublai Khan, falls um, to the White Lotus Rebellion. And now we see a return to a very classic Chinese dynasty. 
the Ming dynasty, guys, in many ways is similar to the Song dynasty, the dynasty before the Yan dynasty. Um, the Ming dynasty is really a return to normalcy. It's a return to the classic Chinese customs, and it's discouraging any influence that the Mongols have left on China. They're breaking away from Mongol influence. In fact, it was even discouraged to name your children a Mongolian name. They wanted to return to Confucianism. They established a national school system. They bring back that civil service exam that is still based off of Confucianism, and they reestablish the bureaucracy that is based off of that civil service exam. So it is almost as like life back to normal. The Mongols never happened. That is what the Ming Dynasty is is starting to promote. Um, once again, they're going to return back to trade that is based off of the silk industry. Um, they are going to build the royal family, builds the forbidden city in Beijing. So we're going back to, you know, honoring a Chinese emperor. And so things are essentially, you know, back to normal in this stage. And in fact, um, they even are going to rebuild the Great Wall of China. Um, the Great Wall of China is a symbol um, that is back from antiquity. I mean, this starts in um, the Qin dynasty a long, long time back. Um, but of course, the Mongols had no need to keep the Great Wall of China um, running and, and, um, and why support, support it with money and labor when in fact they themselves came from the north. They're not going to block themselves out with the Great Wall of China. But now that the um, Ming Dynasty is in control. They're going to try and protect their their borders by rebuilding this Great Wall of China. And in fact, they have great reason to do so because up to the north, the Mongols still are in their capital, Mongolia. And also we see the, the Manchus to the northeast that are becoming more and more powerful. And so um, the Ming is actually first going to try to expand. They're going to, the Mongols strike back. They take the emperor hostage. Um, and after this, the Chinese realize they need to rebuild this wall. And so they do so. And the Great Wall in the Ming Dynasty, guys, is a, is a really good example of the fact that China in the Ming starts its period of isolation. It starts to try to stop interactions with other um, with other places. And while the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty after it are going to expand, they're going to expand by land and they're going to discourage uh, maritime trade, sea based trade. And the reason they do that, of course, is because of Zanke's voyages, uh, which we've talked about many times. But in the context of the Ming Dynasty, we'll understand that because the Ming Dynasty has this. Um, return to the classic Confucian ideologies. Um, the scholar gentry is so important in the Ming Dynasty because, once again, they are the bureaucrats, they are the, the top class of China, and they're not going to like all of these foreign ideas bringing back to China. And so, of course, we have the discouragement to sail away from China, to interact with other cultures, which leads to isolationism. And this is unfortunate because in this time period, the Portuguese start to make their way into the Indian Ocean. Um, and we talk a lot about Europe and the Portuguese when we get into our next time period, uh, excuse me, the next lecture from this same time period. Um, but because the Portuguese make their way into the Indian Ocean and all the way through Southeast Asia over to China, we now have the discussion of how does China deal with these European invaders? Um, at first, during the Ming Dynasty, they're going to arrive and they're going to be treated as barbarians. And that totally makes sense when you consider the fact that the Ming Dynasty is a very classic conservative Chinese dynasty. They are supporting Confucianism. They are returning to the classics of China. And when you see these, these very Catholic um, Portuguese arriving, trying to convert people like the scholar gentry, they're not going to have much success. Um, however, during the Qing dynasty, the, our Jesuits and our Europeans, um, Catholic Europeans, are going to have a lot more success in converting the Chinese um, to their religion. And that's because the Qing dynasty is a very, very different dynasty with very, very different ideals. Um, first of all, how does the Qing dynasty come about? Um, there's a famine, famine in 1644. Um, and every time that there is something like that, a famine, there is a rebellion in China because of a religious belief called the Mandate of Heaven. Um, the emperor is supposed to rule over China with this mandate given by the gods to rule. And when something like a famine occurs, it is supposed to be a sign 
then in fact, the ruler has lost the mandate of heaven. In this case, a peasant led by Lisa Chang is going to say the emperor has lost the mandate of heaven. We are going to lead a revolt. He seizes Beijing. And now Beijing has been conquered. And so now our Ming dynasty has to try and put down this rebellion, but they try and they try and they cannot put down the rebellion. And so now we have the Manchus up to the north of China. Here's our Manchus. Um, and they're saying, well, let us through the Great Wall of China and we will help you put down this rebellion by Li Zicheng. Let us through the gate at the Shanghai Pass. Um, the Ming faithfully decides, yes, we will let you through the wall. And this proves to be a terrible decision because as the Qing do come in and push out Li Zicheng's rebel government, they also seize Beijing and declare a new dynasty, a Manchu controlled dynasty. During this time period, there's massive migration of Manchurians into China. And Manchurians are ethnically different than the Han Chinese. And you can see that with the change that occurs. So first of all, um, this is once again a foreign control of China, like Mongol control of China. And like the Mongols, they're going to put Manchurians into the top government positions. Um, they're also the biggest change is they're going to make men change their hairstyle. They're going to wear those cues, those braided pigtails in the back, which was a sign of um, respect to the Manchu emperor. And if they didn't make this change, that they would be subject to execution, that they could be killed in the streets for, for disrespecting the emperor. Now, of course, many Chinese resisted Manchu rule initially, but the one smart thing that the Manchus do is learn from the mistakes of the Mongols and the Yan dynasty, and they keep the political system intact. They keep the Chinese bureaucracies, they keep the civil service exams, and this helps the Han Chinese accept the Qing as the legitimate rulers of China. One of our Qing emperors that is very important in this time period is Emperor Kongxi. Emperor Kongxi is going to expand. He's going to expand a lot. He's going to expand in Taiwan, into Mongolia, into Central Asia, um, and into Tibet. And But all of this expansion is very, very expensive. And we talk about one of the themes of this course. One of the big ones is that China during this time period um, is starting to a long economic decline. And the reason being is not only because they're not trading by sea, but because they're going through all of these expensive expansions. And if you're not bringing a lot of money in from trade by sea, but you are expanding a lot, you're going to start to run your treasury dry, your economy dry. And that um, starts to happen during the Qing dynasty under Kongxi. Kongxi is also going to create a, a new dictionary of 42,000 characters. He was a scholar. Um, and Emperor Kongxi, because of this, um, is going to invite other um, religions and peoples to um, visit him in his court. And unlike the Ming dynasty, the Qing dynasty is going to be more tolerant to Christians and especially Jesuits. The Jesuits are going to come in um, and bring all of these wonderful objects like the telescope to impress the Chinese. Um, Kongxi will let um, these these Christians come in and, and visit his court. And because of this, we see hundreds of thousands of Chinese convert to Roman Catholicism in this time period. So this is the true entryway of Christianity into China during Kongxi's rule in the Qing dynasty. The other emperor that we need to know from the Qing dynasty is Chen Long. Chen Long like Kongxi is going to expand. He expands into the Xinjiang prov province over here, which is the home of the Uyghurs who are Muslim. And because of this, our Uyghurs don't really resent being controlled by China. They're going to resist. And because of this, we're going to have some bad hostilities where we see mass killings of the local population. Still to this day, there is lots of unrest in the Xinjiang province where um, the Uyghurs resist Chinese control. But because of all of these, again, all of these expansions, moving into Tibet again, Nepal, then trying unsuccessfully to come into Burma and Vietnam, um, China is, is spending a lot of money. And they're spending a lot of money they don't have. And Chen Long realizes that he needs to reopen trade or do something that's going to bring money back into China. And because of this, he does two things. The first is opening up one port for trade at Guangzhou. This is a very, very fateful decision by Chen Long because this is that one port system that's going to upset the British in our next time period leading to the Opium Wars. The other thing that Chen Long does 
is raise taxes. And once again, as a result, we have another rebellion, the White Lotus Rebellion. And you might be saying, Mr. Hill, don't we have, haven't we learned about a White Lotus Rebellion before? Yes, we have. We learned about the White Lotus Rebellion that put down the Yan Dynasty, the Mongol Dynasty. This is another White Lotus Rebellion, but it's doing the exact same thing. If you think about it, it is resisting against a foreign ruler, in this case, a Manchu ruler. The previous one was against a Mongol ruler, and it was an attempt to reinstate the Ming Dynasty. The first White Lotus Rebellion was to instate the Ming Dynasty. And so both of them are essentially doing the same thing, trying to get rid of a foreign ruler and instate the Ming Dynasty. The Qing government this time puts down the rebellion ruthlessly. And then we move over to Japan and we are almost done with the lecture today. So um, in Japan, we, we last, last left Japan in a very feudalistic society where at the top we have a military dictator called the Shogun, but really the, the um, controllers of the country were the daimyo, which are large land-holding aristocratic families that are going to employ armies, private armies like the samurai, to control their respective regions. Um, and then, of course, we have peasants working on the land in a largely agricultural society and a largely isolated society. Now, these daimyos are sovereign. They control their respective regions. Um, and the shogun is little more than just a, a figurehead. Um, now, there is an emperor, but that truly is a figurehead because the emperor has no political power whatsoever. Now, this, is, this system is going to change in this time period because we have three unifiers of Japan that are going, they're all from daimyo families, and they're all going to use their own army of samurai to try and control more and more territory until all of Japan is united under one ruler. And the stimulus for being able to do this, how come for 700 years no daimyo has been able to do this? Well, because the Portuguese and then the Dutch arrived in this time period that we see some of our daimyo have access to gunpowder weapons for the first time and they're going to be getting these modern rifles um, from the Portuguese and use those rifles to unify Japan. Um, the, the thing that we learn about during the year that I, that I always give you to kind of remind you guys of these three Japanese unifiers, Oda Nobunaga makes the cake, Toyotomi Hideyoshi baked it, and Tokugawa Ieyasu ate it. And we can kind of go through what that means. Um, we start with Oda Nobunaga. Like I said, he's a daimyo. He, can, he commands his own samurai. And they are now armed with muskets from the Portuguese. And so he is going to start this whole process. He's the guy that's going to mix the cake. How is he going to do this? He's going to set the stage for the unification of Japan by conquering now about what is one third of Japan. He's going to conquer the, at that time, capital Kyoto. Um, he is going to force the daimyo that he conquers to submit to him. And he is going to be a ruler of one third of Japan. Um, however, he is betrayed. He is assassinated. And when he does this, he has started the process of unifying Japan, but, um, he hasn't finished it yet. He hasn't baked the cake. He's only started to mix it. And so Toyotomi Hideyoshi is going to come in and he's going to start to bake the cake. In fact, he does even more than Oda Nobunaga. Um, in fact, he was a close friend and associate with Oda Nobunaga. He's going to come in, unite all of Japan under his control um, and look to start to set up a government ruling all of Japan before he does. And so now we have Toyotomi Hideyoshi. He baked the cake. He's about to take it out of the oven and eat it, but he unfortunately passes away. And so then Tokugawa Ieyasu seizes power and he is going to rule over a unified Japan. Um, what he does is unlike what Toyotomi Hideyoshi was unable to do, Tokugawa Ieyasu is going to be able to set up bureaucracies um, and create a uh, administration that rules over all of Japan. Um, this starts the Tokugawa shogunate. You know that because here's Tokugawa Ieyasu. He's going to create the government called the Tokugawa shogunate, and he's going to rule until 1868. And that is when the Meiji Restoration kicks in, um, where we see the emperor is restored to power after Matthew Perry's exploits into Japan. Um, this time period is called the period of great peace because 
because we do not have the daimyos warring against each other anymore. We have a unified Japan. And how does Tokugawa Ieyasu and his successors and the Tokugawa shogunate able to keep the daimyo from fighting each other? They do this kind of sinister government system that works really well. It's effective, but as I said, it's quite sinister. And what they do under the Tokugawa shogunate is divide Japan into 250 hans. And hans are like states or provinces, they're territories, and each one of them are controlled by a daimyo. Um, now, they can, can the daimyo can control their own han, they have their own army, um, but they must submit to the Tokugawa shogunate. But we've seen this kind of system before, and this system has always failed in the past, because once leaders um, have enough wealth and power in their respective hans, um, what's going to stop them from marching upon the capital and seizing power for themselves? The Tokugawa shogunate did something really smart. Um, they require that the daimyo, the, the lords, maintain residence in both their own han and the capital. And if they wanted to go back to their own han, their family had to stay in Tokyo. And so what this effectively did was keep their family hostage so that the daimyo could not rebel against the Tokugawa shogunate. Um, we actually see this lots of times in this time period. Um, many different rulers do something similar to this, keeping families hostages or moving the, um, the lords or the nobles to the capital to keep watch on them. So the Tokugawa shogunate does this very effectively. All right, guys. Um, that's the end of the lecture. Here is our practice SAQ that you're doing with your partner. Um, identifying one way in which the Ming Dynasty in China represented a return to the ideals important in the Song Dynasty. B is identify one political similarity between all three gunpowder empires. And then C, identify one religious difference between the Ottoman Empire and the Mughal Empire. All right, guys. I um, hope you saw, thought that that was mostly review. I hope you guys are doing well. Happy Friday. And uh, see you guys next week.